How can we just get to the point already? That's what we're going to talk about today. Be sincere, be brief, be seated. Franklin Roosevelt. Today we're going to talk about the book, Smart Brevity, The Power of Saying More with Less, by Jim Vandehey, Mike Allen, and Roy Schwartz. Brevity is kind of an interesting topic because people say a lot and there's so much to read right now. Everyone is asking us to read their newsletter, read this, read social media. You can spend all day just reading and not actually acting or doing anything. And so he said, so this book comes along to help people get better about brevity. Says this book is 28,000 words and 106 minutes to read. I will say that it is a very easy book to read, but it gives some very good points about why this is important. And they're right. Words come at us all the time. We're just reading. And they say, quote, be honest, you're a prisoner to words, writing them, reading them, and listening to them. Oh, it's so true. And again, you're listening to a podcast. Let's just listening to words. Keep listening and we'll keep finding out what we could do to do better. But he says that they're just coming at us all the time. And either we're reading, watching, listening, we're, we're just doing this all day long. And they say that our brains are just getting frazzled, it says. And so then what happens just to protect ourselves is we will skim stuff. We don't really read anything in deep thought. We just click through it. And sometimes we even share it with other people. I know I share articles with my friends all the time. I sometimes share them on Twitter with you. But it says that, you know what? Studies that have been out there showing people reading, people will spend 26 seconds on average reading some piece of content. Ooh. And you know that people spend hours writing email. My friend, Em, she loves to write a carefully crafted email. She spends hours on writing an email. But if people aren't reading them, what can we do to do better? And so she's the one who recommended this book to me, mostly, I think, because I talk too much. I'm not much of a long form writer. I like to do exactly what they say about what I'm writing, bullet points, short points, but talking, maybe I go on just a little too much. They give another study that says that we decide in 17 milliseconds if we like what we're reading and if not, we just go on. So not only are we not spending much time reading anything, we decide in 17 milliseconds whether we're going to even read it at all. And then comes the horrible multitaskers. Okay, I admit it. I'm a horrible multitasker. But our focus is just snapped in and out of things. And so even if we're spending that time reading a document, we're not paying that much attention to that document. We're looking at it and then clearing out of it. And so it says that basically everything that we used as communication pieces in the past is failing. We are at that point where you had the old style magazines. People used to get a magazine and just sit there and read the whole magazine. Maybe not the whole, whole magazine, but maybe 60, 70% of it. And something that was interesting to them. Then it went to web and being articles. And now we're not even reading articles anymore. We're reading short pieces of it. When we get a book, do we read the whole book? Or Now we have all those services that will summarize the book for you or get ChatGPT to summarize the book for you. The days where people read long form text is going away. Now, I'm still that person who loves to read a book. I love to read articles. I love to read long form things. And I do it in a couple different ways. One, Audible. So I listen to a lot of books that way. So for those of you who are wondering, how does Jill get through all these books? It's audible. I listen to a ton of books, but I also have a Kindle chock full of other books. So I read all the time. I don't know if it's when I was born that makes the difference, but right now it's not happening anymore. And we have to rethink how we're going to communicate to other people, like laying in bed and just reading a few pieces here and there. They will look at social media, which are small blips. You know, I always liked YouTube and then TikTok comes along and I say, well, do people really want to just see very short videos? Apparently they really do. So everyone wants things now even shorter than it was before. And he thinks that sometimes it's, you know, maybe it's a thing that of the generation you grew up in, or you're really trying to show people 
your your thinking process. You're trying to convince them of something or you're trying to educate them on something. I don't think there's bad intent there. But then he says that sometimes people are even trying to fake it. They're trying to use so many words because they're trying to impress people. See how very smart I am? And the other part of it is that we learn that way too. You go to college, you're in high school, you're given assignments and they have to be this long. We are told to write and taught to write in these long forms. In the end, how many people actually read our emails? How many people read news stories? You can tell that there are people out there who only read the headlines of news stories. And it's unfortunate because the person who writes the article doesn't write the headline. So I will see an article and it will say something like, cows are the worst animals ever. And then you read the article and it doesn't even mention cows. Does this person even read the article? So unfortunately, if you just go through life reading headlines or the main title of a story, you have no idea what it actually says. Because half of them, I'd say a solid half of them, don't even say the thing that the title said. And I think sometimes it's just because they're not even reading the article. They just assume what's in the article. But I think, too, it's people trying to use their job to persuade other people. So I'm going to write a headline hoping you never read the main article because I want you to only see the headline I want to give you. So I think it's a little bit of a power slash persuasion thing, too. The good news is he says that if we learn how to get through the noise and we learn how to write in such a way where we're just getting the main details out, people will read what we have to say. And it says, quote, short, not shallow. Just because you only have a few words does not mean what you're saying is going to be unimportant, not structured, not valuable. We're just going to use less words. He says that he has four points that they're going to teach through the course of this book. And he warns you that it may not be for every situation. But first, you're going to have what he calls a muscular tease, which means the headline. And again, Write a headline that's actually what this article, this email, whatever it is, is really about. Don't be like one of those fake people. Then he says that your first sentence is going to be what's called the lead, L-E-D-E. That's going to be the most important thing, the most memorable piece of everything that you're saying. If people only read one sentence of your piece, it's the one point you want to say. And I guess for me, This podcast, I try to do a lead where I'll say, do you want to know how to shut up and only say three things? That's what we're going to talk about today because I'm trying to entice you into listening to the whole podcast. I hope that it makes it interesting for you. So it's a good part. And so they gave the example out of Axios blog, which it says, your CEO has no lunch buddy. Offices are opening up, but only the executives want to go to work. So it's trying to entice you into reading that whole article. Then they say the next part is the context or why this matters. What is important about this article? Now, you may look at that and say, well, okay, you know, only executives are going back into the office. They're looking for collaboration. But why do I care? Because I work from home. Now we're going to have to say this is why it's important to you. The next part of it is to go deeper to give people that ability that if they have said yes all the way up through this point, they're going to get what they want out of this article, this blog, something like that. I'll give you an example of even on a bad side. I saw a Twitter post about this guy who was going to teach a class live on Twitter. Oh, okay, that's interesting. So a good, strong title. It had an amazing lead. And I got to listening to this live event. And I had to leave after, I think it was 40 minutes. I had somewhere I had to be. Not once was the topic that he was going to talk about even brought up in the first 40 minutes. So one and two, great. It got me enticed. Three, never happened. I walked out. So unfortunately, we have to do all of the things where it matters. And he says that you have to imagine your reader, your person listening. I mean, I imagine you this way, a real person with real job, real needs, and someone who would be engaged by the topic. Then you're going to present clarifying information, something that's exciting, something that's going to educate people. And then your message, it says, will echo out because as your listeners, in my case, or your readers, they will see that you're not someone who wastes their time and they will come back to you time and time again. 
And they recommend that as you're going through this process to ask other people to look at your stuff and, and give you suggestions about where you could cut, how you could trim this down. Maybe your big idea is not such a big idea. It's humiliating. And <laughs> let me tell you, M is a wonderful writer and she is fantastic at editing things. It can be humiliating. Back when we were in college, I would give her my papers and I would be devastated how much editing went on. You have to realize that a real friend has your back and is going to help you to become better. And they say in general, whenever they have some section in the book, they could just end all of it and then stop. It is better to just stop instead of saying, a, they say a pile of words, instead of making people guess at what you're going to say, just be effective. And he says that what happens, unfortunately, is that, quote, we tend to communicate selfishly, which means we're thinking about what we want to hear or what we want to say. So even in an apology, they give this example. Here's their quote on the apology. I'm really sorry I said that, but here's what I was thinking. And what you did before upset me and provoked me to say those mean things. It's a lot of words when in the end they say you should just say. I'm sincerely sorry I said that. It's more clear that your intent is not to excuse what you're trying to say, but instead just say it. Just say the apology. And it says this quote, and I love this quote. I'm going to use this forever. Cowards hide in clauses. Every time you feel like you're making up phrases and clauses, they always talk about that in jokes. Like if you have to explain the joke, it's not a joke. If you're putting so many clauses in trying to explain something to someone, you're probably making a mess of it. It says, just be yourself and don't hide in a word dump. Uh, that's amazing. I, I really like that. So here are some tricks that they tell you when doing this. That first of all, focus on the person you're trying to tell. Then think about the one thing you want them to remember and then type it out. It's good advice to just go with those two types of things. And if you're unclear about either of those things, who's reading this or listening to this and What's the most important thing you want them to hear? You're going to get lost and you won't be able to do it. He says, quote, write like a human for humans. It's really good advice in all of that. Now, I work in software and a lot of times I have to tell people things about I created a ticket for you. I'm investigating this issue. I found the problem. Here it is. And I notice that a lot of times when people do this, they write many, many words. And I try to get to the point. They talk about in an email, like a business email, we'll talk a little bit about this more, that emails start like this. Oh, hi, Sarah. How are you doing? I haven't heard from you in a long time. I hope your kids are good. Are you still racing horses? And how's your dog? Right? So a lot of words at the beginning. By the way, I found that what you reported to me was a bug and will be fixed in the next release. You know, you can go on and say something like that and the email can be really long. What I started to do, because this was different advice from a different book, is turn your emails upside down. Hi, Sarah. What you reported, you're right. That's a bug, and it's going to be fixed in the next release. And I sure hope your dog is all right you know, and that you're still racing horses. Then you can go to the other part of it, but you want to keep in mind. I, I think this book would rather you didn't go to the other part of it, but it wants you to keep in mind who you're talking to and what is it they need to hear. And so that often means to me, I'm going to write in bullet points. I'm not going to write in big, blobby paragraphs because nothing makes people's eyes roll more than big, blobby paragraphs. Just so you know, to solve this problem, one, you have to delete the line. Two, you have to recreate the line, but give it a different name. Three, then you can edit the line and give it the name you gave it before. Easy peasy, right? Bullet points, very clear. It says two, that you have to worry about the fact that when you're writing people, it's not like sitting in front of a person face to face because people get what you mean when you're talking to them live as a human being. But when they can't see you, we have to be able to write clearly enough and to the point enough so that they understand what you're saying without all the social cues. So then you write the one thing and according, like I said, to the book and then try to shorten it if you can. Because less words are more. I always heard that if you had to pay a dollar per word, what words would you take out of there? It says, get out rid of all the weak words, the adjectives. And then it says, then stop, be done. See, they don't even want me talking about the dog or the horse. But 
I got to be friendly, right? Anyway, that's it. That's how you just do the communication. Our human nature, it says, is just to keep talking and talking and communicating. And in the, what they say is it kills relationships and communication. So just stop doing it. Is it? If I don't ask my friend Sarah about her horse and her dog, that rude? I don't know. Maybe the point is, is that on my support emails, I just stop. And then every once in a while, I send her an email and say, hey, I'm just saying, hi, how's your horse and dog? I don't know. I still think being friendly is nice too. They bring the point then back to the 26 seconds that if your email can't be read in 26 seconds, what you're saying might be wasted. And so he says it's frightening. That's a little frightening to me, even though I use bullet points already. But he says it's liberating because now we don't have to do all the hubbub around our emails and all the things that we're trying to say. We're going to be short, sweet, and to the point. And this book, too, is like that, too. He is just sticking to the facts. They're saying the bare minimum and then not putting in any fluff in it. They're just getting to what it is. And he gives some examples. Here he says something. Hi, I hope you're having a good day. Here's how to set up your utilities. See, they had a friendly sentence in there, so I guess it's okay. Or I highlighted in yellow the important part. That's the part they're going to read and maybe everything else. But here's the fun thing is all that time you spent writing, you're going to have time back. You're not going to be spending so much time doing that. You won't have to write 20 pages of something and your people won't have to read 20 pages of something. You'll get to do something else. They gave this piece from Linda Stone, who's a consultant, says that it's continuous partial attention. Meaning that no matter what we're doing, if we're providing videos, maybe even this podcast, right? Are you listening to this podcast when you're driving to work or when you're at work or what you're at home washing the dishes? People aren't paying attention the whole time. They're doing continuous partial attention. So if you know that people are multitasking, know that people have limited time and attention, making your strong points and nothing more will help them and helps you too. So we're going to go ahead and stop there. My challenge to you is think about one area where you're just writing too much. Is it emails? Are you a letter writer? Are you trying to write a book? Or are you like me, chatting on a podcast? See if you can't, cut it down. Get through what they talk about, those four points, where you're going to have a strong tease. You're going to have that amazing first sentence. You're going to say why what you're saying matters. And then you're going to hit the whole area strong, bringing out only the really good points. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and leave a review if you wouldn't mind. I would love to get more people listening to the podcast and someday have a community going. So if you tell other people, if you write a review, and you subscribe, those things can help this podcast grow and gets us closer one step, one small step to being a community. And remember, grabbing people's attention starts with small steps. <laughs>